Another Place, Another Time, a story based on one of the pages in Chris Van Alsberg's The Mysteries of Harris Burdick, story by Mr. Cron. Mom, something's wrong with Dad, yelled Clyde frantically as his tiny legs propelled him through the doorway. But as his gaze swept past the kitchen table, he knew that she wasn't going to answer him any time soon. He slumped down heavily in the chair next to her and tried to wrap his mind around the craziness of the moment. He had sat for no more than a moment when the loud click of the hot water kettle snapped his gaze from the slight rise and fall of his mother's shallow breathing to the marble counter across the room. Tea sounded nice right about now. Halfway through a cup of scalding tea, Clyde's brain allowed himself to run through the facts of the past 30 minutes. His young detective brain had always been good at puzzles. Just like Batman, he could figure anything out with the right clues. He had been playing by himself in the backyard as his father was mowing the lawn. While he was crouched behind a bush, fighting the invisible enemy soldiers for the 40th time that morning, he noticed the mower made a strange, loud grinding sound. He quickly poked his head up over the bush, desperately hoping his father hadn't run over another one of his toys. What he saw instead didn't bring relief. The mower was sitting crookedly atop the metal sprinkler that was on the far side of the yard, still running, sputtering and clanking. That was the first clue something wasn't right. He looked back from the mower to where his father was and saw that he was standing and staring at the mower from about 15 feet back. At least, Clyde thought that's what he was staring at. Clyde rushed his eight-year-old body over to the mower and flicked the kill switch on the side. The motor died instantly and Clyde winced as he saw both the sprinkler and the mower were both ruined. He hunched his shoulders and cringed waiting for the angry voice of his father to smash into the newfound quiet. But it never came. His father never moved or uttered a sound. That was the second clue something wasn't right. Like a timid deer approaching a wolf, Clyde slowly stepped towards his still-standing father, expecting colorful words to explode into the air at any time. He stood directly in front of his father. That was when Clyde saw that the man's eyes were open, but not seeing anything. It was as if his father was staring right through him. Clue number three. Dad? He whispered. No answer. Dad? He spoke shakily. His father was breathing. His eyes were open, but he wasn't moving. Silence. Clyde took a chance and poked the belly in front of him nothing. He looked fearfully up at the strongest man he'd ever known one more time and then began running towards the house to get his mother. And now he sat, drinking tea and putting the clues together. But he came up with nothing. What had he done that would cause this? After an hour of poking his parents with, his first, with first his finger and then with a fork, but gently rethinking the pitchfork, Clyde discovered something very interesting. I mean, this was all beyond interesting already, but this next part was downright cool. His parents were maneuverable. He figured this out when he held his mother's hand and stood up before letting go. She silently, like a doll, stood up with him. Not looking anywhere, not saying anything, but standing on her own power. He briefly thought she was done playing, but... She didn't do anything other than stand there. He started to pull away and her body leaned into his direction just slightly. He took her hand and began to step back. She followed. No resistance. He walked her all the way around the kitchen table and then gently pushed down on her shoulders. She sat. Clyde walked outside and took his father by the hand. Just like his mother, he led his father into the house. He even walked up the stairs. He sat his father next to his mother and contemplated what to do next. If he told anyone what had happened, 
would they take him away from his parents? Would they put an eight-year-old in jail? The horror. He hadn't meant for this to happen. Surely it would be blamed on him should anyone discover his parents in this state. No, he would figure out how to hide this from everyone. But exactly that moment, there was a knock at the door. It was a gentle yet insistent knock made by a bare hand. While Clyde worriedly wondered why they hadn't rung the doorbell, the knock came again, less gentle, more insistent. Trembling, he peeked out the window beside the front door and was met with yet another puzzle. It was a boy, kind of. The boy looked like he was from another time. Clyde had seen pictures of boys who looked like this in his grandfather's old golf magazines from the 1940s. He wore long brown trousers, <clears throat> fancy laced shoes with white spats, a neat collared white v-neck shirt, and atop his medium cut black hair, a gray cotton flat cap. Clyde could see that he also wore a large bulky backpack. As he was admiring the brown burlap of the backpack, Clyde realized with a start that the boy was looking back at him through the window. The boy opened the door and strolled right inside. Clyde gasped. How did you open the door? The boy stared at Clyde with a perplexed face and bowed his head slightly. My liege, he began. We cannot tarry. Where are they? Time is of the essence. He marched right past the open-mouthed Clyde and began looking into doorways. He paused at the kitchen door and walked up to the doll-like adults. As Clyde watched from the doorframe, the boy produced what looked like a key and held it close to the back of his mother's head. As the key came within a few inches of her collar, a keyhole appeared at the base of her neck. The key slid effortlessly inside, and the boy turned it with a click. Clyde's mouth nearly hit the floor when her gray hair lifted like the trunk of a car, tilting forward, exposing what looked like machinery where her brains should be. As the boy took a screwdriver and began turning something inside her skull, Clyde's world went black. The shaking and clattering of what seemed to him like a roller coaster brought Clyde back to the light. His aching head felt wood beneath him, jostling him even more cruelly awake. Where was he? And why did it smell like the lake? Ah, your majesty, you awake! A cheery and familiar voice spoke. As he lifted his groggy head and fluttered open his heavy eyes, Clyde recognized the boy from the golf magazine. Golf magazine boy? Mother's keyhole! Clyde jumped to his feet in an instant and discovered the floor was moving. Fast. He pitched crazily to the side and saw the ground rushing past at a furious pace. Wah! Clyde yelled. In an instant, the boy reached out a quick, strong hand and grabbed Clyde by the front of his sailor shirt and pulled him toward the center of the fast-moving vehicle, all while holding on to a rope connected to a sail. Clyde's brain was having a hard time of all this. Careful, Your Majesty. Wouldn't want to have finally returned you and then have you lost to the Iridium Sea's myriad of protective sea life. As Clyde slid back onto the floor, he said the first words that came to his mind. Why am I wearing a sailor's shirt? The boy calmly cocked his head and looked at Clyde. Y your Majesty, I, I brought you an outfit in the style of your family's royal heritage. A brief look of panic crossed his face. Are you dissatisfied with the choice? He looked ready to cry. Um, no, I, I guess it's fine. Don't cry. I, I don't know. What? Clyde looked around in puzzlement. This was making no sense at all. He sat against the back of the rail that Golf Boy was sitting on while steering the sail. Because that was happening. He then saw that they were not alone on this bumpy coaster of a cart. His parents were sitting motionless, almost directly in front of them. But they still weren't moving. They stared directly ahead, silently. 
They were on an old-timey railroad car, the kind you see in mining movies. Except this one didn't have that teeter-totter type handle in the middle. It had a mast and sail instead. It looked like it was made of wood, except for the metal wheels which carried them along loudly along the metal-on-wood railroad tracks. The tracks stretched out in front as far as his eyes could make out. They were built upon a small extended rock and gravel path which divided a massive body of water. There was no wind, yet the sails were full. Um, excuse me, Clyde began. Roderick, my liege, golf boy replied. R Roderick, what's going on? Your Majesty is suffering from some amnesia. You've been through a very harrowing few months in the strange land I gathered you from. Clyde's mouth began spouting out everything at once. Strange land? You mean Steinbeck? And what do you mean months? I've lived there for all of my eight years, and why do you keep calling me liege and majesty? Why are you dressed like a 1940s golf boy? Where am I? Why are we sailing a railroad car? What's going on with my parents? I'm so confused. Your Majesty, all will be answered shortly. We can see your home through the mist. Would you like to take the sail for when you greet your subjects? Still stunned and understanding nothing, Clyde took the rope that guided the sail and looked ahead through the mist, which was slowly revealing an enormous crystal castle in the distance. If there was an answer, he'd find it there. Thanks for listening.